Ladies and gentlemen, it is 6 o'clock. Uh, one of the candidates that scheduled to join us this evening, Bob Davis, is running behind. He did call in. So we're going to give an additional five minutes and we'll get underway. Thank you.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third night of the candidate debates brought to you locally by the Sweetwater GOP. I'm your host, Johnny Kay. I want to acknowledge and thank those joining us this evening from the beautiful Broadway Theater in downtown Rock Springs, as well as those joining us online. Many have theorized throughout the ages how long a democracy might last. Lord Titler said the average lifespan was about 200 years. Although ours is not a true democracy, more of a representative republic, your being here tonight, either in this theater or online, is an active step in ensuring Lord Titler has continued to be proven wrong. Speaking of being civically minded, I want to extend my sincerest thanks this evening to Bruce Pivick for volunteering his expertise and overseeing the technical aspects of the debate, as well as sharing his online via his platform at Wild 4 News. Thank you, Bruce. Also assisting me on the stage tonight in aiding candidates by keeping time, Tara Kendrick and my bride, Kelly. Elizabeth Bingham contacted me in September, rather in February, with regards to hosting this debate. She had figured correctly, even back then, that the primary election in Sweetwater County would determine the election. She was spot on. I want to thank Elizabeth and the other members of the Sweetwater GOP for working tirelessly in putting this function together, as well as crafting questions that are specific not only to the various races, but also the candidates and the GOP as a whole. Tonight's questions and answers will not only guide voters in what candidate may be best qualified for a particular job, but also may guide us to which campaigns best align with the party platform. Many of this evening's questions were actually culled from online submissions from Sweetwater County voters. Now then, to aid candidates in managing their response time, the committee will be implementing time paddles to show remaining time increments. A green paddle will be displayed when 60 seconds remain. A yellow paddle will be displayed when 30 seconds remain. A red paddle when 10 seconds are left. If a candidate is still speaking after their time limit expires, the microphone will be turned off. The microphone rule will also be in effect for rebuttals and opening and closing statements, so candidates, please plan accordingly. Meanwhile, candidates will each be given up to two minutes for an opening and closing statement. A point of order can be raised by any candidate who in a particular race is mentioned by name by one of their competitors. In the event that any candidate raises a point of order, they'll be given 60 seconds to respond. Likewise, a 60-second time period will be allowed for a candidate rebuttal. If a specific candidate is not asked for a rebuttal, they may ask for one. Rebuttals will be moderator approved and will be limited to one person per question. And tonight's debates will cover the following races. First and foremost, our Sweetwater House District Forum, then the Sweetwater County House District 60 debate, Sweetwater County Senate District 11 address from Larry Hicks, and the Sweetwater County Senate District 13 debate as well. And with that, let's get underway. For our House District Forum, I want to welcome the following. Joshua Thomas, J.T. Larson, also known candidate for House District 17. Representative Scott Heiner, currently the House Representative for House District 18, seeking re-election. Cody Wiley, candidate for House District 39. Bob Davis, candidate for House District 47. Also Representative Clark Stith, currently the House Representative for House District 48, seeking re-election. House District 47 debate has been canceled because a candidate, Clyde Johnson, is unable to attend, so we moved his opponent, candidate Bob Davis, into this House District forum. This is a forum and not a debate because none of the candidates attending are running against each other. Let's begin with opening statements, and let me begin, if I may, with Bob Davis. That's lucky. I, I was the opening statement at the Sportsman's Forum, too. Only I sat on the other end of the table. Okay, uh, for you, those of you who do not know me, my name is Bob Davis. I have a strong background in oil and gas, ranching, and hospitality. I've been a businessman and a job creator for 35 years, so I know what the needs are to balance your income versus your expense. I'm a conservative Republican, and I will vote no on new taxes. I am pro-life. We have to improve the emotional support and care for the mothers and streamline the adoption system and associated with these new children. We need, these, we need them to be in loving homes. We have the privilege of having three adopted children in our families. I'm a su strong supporter of the Second Amendment in our rural areas. We are the first line of defense. Seconds can make a difference between life and death. Our right to bear arms has nothing to do with the hunting rifles but it's our constitutional right to protect and defend ourselves. 
I have served on many boards in Carbon County. I'm a been on the Little Snake River Conservation District, the Savory Little Snake River Conservancy District, and I'm currently the Wyoming Gaming Commission Chairman, appointed by Governor Meade. I'm familiar with the workings of the state legislators. I have appeared before state committees, water development, gaming commission, budget hearings, joint appropriation, tourism, recreation boards. I believe our nation, oh, 30 seconds, I'm doing good. I believe our nation is at a crossroads, and we need to return to our founding father's values and the Constitution of the United States. It is critical that we send a strong, proven leader to represent House District 47, and I'd re appreciate your vote on August 16th. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And if I may, I'd like to read Clyde Johnson's statement. My name is Clyde Johnson. I'm running for House District 47. I was born and raised in Carbon County. I'm a fourth generation rancher on the family ranch near Elk Mountain. I also worked at Sinclair Refinery for over 10 years. I've been married for 42 years. Our sons both graduated from Saratoga High School and both work in and around the area. We are proud grandparents of soon to be five grandchildren. I'm a lifetime member of the NRA. American Quarter Horse Association, and strong supporter of the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. I would like to represent our district in Cheyenne this January. I think it's important to have a strong voice in the legislature to ensure that our families and all the future generations can continue to enjoy this way of life without being burdened by the federal government overreach. Some of our most pressing issues are education, water, and funding, and I'll do my best to work with the people of this district and the state to find sustainable solutions. Next, I'd like to hear from J.T. Larson. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Thank you to the Sweetwater County Republican Party for putting this informative event together. Thank you also to Johnny Kay, our moderator, and everyone else who has made this event possible. My name is J.T. Larson, and I am running as a Republican candidate for Wyoming's House District 17. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to speak to you about my platform this evening. My intentions for running are not out of anger or frustration. I'm running for this position to be a conservative voice for the people in my district. For the past three to five elections, there has not been a Republican candidate who has ran for office in this House district. In 2018, there was a Republican candidate who forfeited the election because they moved out of state. The time has come that the voters in House District 17 have a voice that represents their conservative values. My passion for Sweetwater County and the respect I have for his residents will be my guide when making decisions at the state legislature. Thank you. Thank you, JT. And at this time, I'd like to hear from Representative Heiner in your opening remarks. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to go off, off uh, on a tangent a little bit for my introduction. I'm going to talk about crossover voting. Uh, this is a, an important election that's coming up, and a lot of focus is on the U.S. House of Representatives. But uh, we're hearing a lot of uh, Democrats that are party switching right now so that they can vote in, that, in this primary election and influence who we, we support as a GOP. But what happened to our crossover bill? Last session, there was a, a crossover prohibition bill that was passed by our good friends in the Senate, overwhelmingly I might add, and it came over to the House, the Wyoming House. The Speaker of the House assigned that bill to uh, the Appropriations Committee rather than uh, a committee that would be more appropriate that deals with elections or, or legislation. Why did he assi assign that to the Appropriations Committee? It's because he wanted that to be killed and it was killed on a, vo a vote of five to two. Fortunately, my, my uh, peer here, Representative Stith, voted for the crossover vote, but it didn't come to the floor. The, the Speaker of the House and the floor majority leader have too much control in our legislature. This was an eye-opener for me as I went to Cheyenne. I found out that there are two people that are controlling the legislature, and I'd like to end that because we are all duly representatives, representing the same constituent, the same number of constituents, but we are controlled by two individuals. And it's time to put an end to that, bring the power back to the people, and let the, the people be heard equally throughout the state. 
Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to being able to represent uh, House District 18 in the next coming, coming years as well. Thank you, Representative Heiner. And with two minutes, I'd like to hear from Cody Wiley. I hope everybody has an enjoyable evening. I'd like to thank the Sweetwater GOP for having me. Thank Johnny Kay and Wild 4 News for their contributions to make tonight a possibility. I know giving us this platform takes endless amounts of effort and sacrifice of your personal time. So once again, thank you. I'm a lifelong resident of Wyoming, born and raised here in Sweetwater County. I graduated from Rock Springs High School, followed by an associate's degree from Western Wyoming Community College. I then earned my bachelor's degree in political science at the University of Wyoming. Go Pokes. After graduating, I chose to return home to contribute to my family's <coughs> construction business. <coughs> in doing so, I was immersed in the ins and outs of how our economy would work here in Sweetwater County. I gained an understanding of how the state level decisions can affect us here at home drastically in one way or another. While people in our communities hang on with the boom and bust cycles that, that have been a way of life here in the Cowboy States for far too long. I've been a Republican since I was old enough to vote. The conservative values I grew up with in my family and community run deep within my fabric. I believe in strong family principles. I will defend our second and first amendments because I believe that is <coughs> held dearly to all Wyomingites. I believe in Wyoming having the right to govern itself and not a group of bureaucrats from Washington, D.C. Wyoming needs to defend every ounce of water we have and not give an inch in the fight for it. I will also fight to keep our public lands free and open. I believe that the most prominent issue we are currently facing is diversification of Wyoming's economy and Sweetwater's economy, Sweetwater County's economy. We need to keep our taxes low, but at the same time, it is pivotal to us to foster, for us to foster growth within our private sector. My name is Cody Wiley, and I'm running for House District 39. Vote Wiley in the upcoming elections. For my family and yours, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Cody. And finally, let's hear from Representative Clark Stiff. My name is Clark Stiff. I represent House District 48, which is East Rock Springs and now part of North Rock Springs as well. I'd also like to thank uh, Johnny K., Bruce Pivick, uh, YO4 News, and the Sweetwater County Republican Party for hosting this event. Thank you uh, so very much. I agree with Representative Heiner that you should not be allowed to change your party registration on Election Day, and that's why I supported uh, the bill that would prohibit that, and for a really simple reason. If you're going to play a, a, a game in sports, for example, you need to decide before the game starts uh, what team you're on. So I think that's common sense. Uh, let me tell you just briefly a couple things that I have done and then what I, what I would like to get done uh, in the future if I am reelected. So uh, I was a co-sponsor of the Stand Your Ground legislation, uh, which passed. Uh, I also voted for the Second Amendment Preservation Act, so I support the Second Amendment uh, wholeheartedly. The, on economic development, I've been in favor of having the Bitter Creek Project funded. Uh, and the Bitter Creek Project, it's here in downtown Rock Springs. Uh, it's not about the creek itself, it's about people because the people who live in the old part of downtown, uh, if you have a mortgage on your house, you have to pay very expensive flood insurance premiums. And the whole purpose of the Bitter Creek Project is to get the old downtown out of the floodplain. So I support that. Uh, we need to address ambulance service, which is why I proposed a successful amendment to our ARPA funding bill, Senate File 66, which added an additional $5 million to, for a regional pilot program for uh, regionalization of ambulance service. And I think in our county should be hopefully able to take advantage of that. Finally, I'd like to say for the, we got to protect our firefighters. We were able to put in $75 million to protect our uh, retired firefighters from Rock Springs. So I think proud of that. And I will stop and ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Stith. It seems like the last time you and I visited, we were talking about Triumph motorcycles. And I think tonight we've got loftier pursuits to discuss. Speaking of which, let's begin round one. I'm coming to J.T. Larson. J.T., are you pro-life or pro-choice? And what is your opinion of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade? Thank you. I am pro-life, and my opinion on the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade is that um, I think it's a good thing that the state it's in the state's hands. Um, it's not a federal ma matter, and I think... Uh, that, that's something we'll deal with in the future when we uh, have a session. Thank you. Thank you, JT. Next, I want to come to Representative Heiner. 
Uh, sir, are you pro-life or pro-choice? What is your opinion of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade? Thank you. I, I, I think this is a great topic. I was a co-sponsor for the anti-abortion bill, uh, House Bill 92. I was just looking at my lapel. I normally wear the little feet, the pin, that shows that I am pro-life. Uh, Roe versus Wade, I am glad it was overturned because those kind of decisions are, are supposed to be left up to the state, not to the federal constitution. The state uh, should deal with matters of health. And so I'm glad that that's been turned back to the states so that they can determine state by state whether they will support abortion or not. But I am very much pro-life. Thank you, Representative. Same question to Cody Wiley. Are you pro-life or pro-choice? What is your opinion on the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade? Yes, thank you, Johnny. I'm pro-life. I believe as soon as the fetus has a heartbeat, it's alive and it has its own set of rights. Um, Roe v. Wade, I think, was good to be overturned but because it's convoluted. It's not just about a woman's choice. It's about states' rights. And I believe the states have the right to decide how they want to govern their health practices within, within their means. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Bob Davis, same question to you, sir. Yes, I am pro-life. Uh, the only, uh, I I'm, I'm believe that the state of Wyoming should be in charge of that as far as the, and then, like I, I said in my opening remarks, uh, the one thing that comes along with that is we need to improve the emotional support and care for the mothers and figure out how to streamline the adoption system and the associated expenses that the, that these children will need to come into loving homes. 60 seconds already. Thank you, sir. And finally, Representative Stiff, same question. Are you pro-life or pro-choice? And what is your opinion on the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade? Thank you for the question. I think we always knew that the constitutional underpinnings of Roe v. Wade were weak, and by the Supreme Court overturning it, it does return the question back to the individual states uh, where people can decide that question uh, on a state-by-state -state basis. I voted in favor of House Bill 92 on final passage that has the exceptions for uh, rape and incest. As you all are probably aware, Judge Owens in uh, Jackson has entered an injunction to prevent uh, that House bill from going into effect uh, right now. I believe it's important for us to respect the rule of law, to respect the process, and we'll see what the Wyoming Supreme Court does with that. It may well be that the constitutional amendment that was recently adopted in the Wyoming Constitution to guarantee individuals the right to make their own health care decisions may result in the Wyoming Supreme Court finding a state-based uh, right to abortion. That would, if that happens, uh, that would put us roughly where uh, Kansas is. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Stith. And let me keep it right there if I could, sir. Representative Stith, what is your position on Medicaid expansion? And please explain why. That's a, that's a great question. So I like to be practical. I like to solve problems. I do a fair amount of consumer bankruptcy work. And one of the most common reasons for people to file bankruptcy is because they have high medical bills. That is, someone's living paycheck to paycheck. They're doing OK. But suddenly, they have gallbladder surgery. They're not insured. They get hit with a $12,000 bill, and it puts them under they come to my office. So that's the situation as it is right now. We have an opportunity, if we do Medicaid expansion, is that the state will actually come out financially ahead on that deal. And the reason we would is for two reasons. Right now, or in the past, before, before COVID, the federal government would reimburse the state uh, 50 cents on the dollar for existing Medicaid patients. Uh, if the state of Wyoming enters into Medicaid expansion, which would allow essentially the Affordable Care Act to apply to those who are in the, in the under less than 135, 38% of the poverty level. If we do that, then our federal matching percentage would go up to 60%, 62%, which is where Utah's is, for example. If we do that, when you crunch all the numbers, uh, basically expanding Medicaid uh, results in a net positive to the bottom line uh, for the state. So long answer to that question, but I'm certainly willing to entertain a reasonable Medicaid expansion. 
Thank you, Representative Stith. Let me come now to Bob Davis, the same question. What is your position on Medicaid expansion, and please explain why. I'm not in favor of Medicaid expansion because I believe it's a, an additional burden upon the taxpayers of the state of Wyoming. Uh, I've seen and personally experienced what Obamacare has done to people, so I don't see where the overreach of the federal government into our private lives and medical care should exist. I'm in favor of the free market. Very good. Thank you. Let me come next to Cody Wiley. The same question. Cody, what is your position on Medicaid expansion? And please explain why. I believe that we should review Medicaid expansion within the state of Wyoming. And like uh, Representative Stiff said, if, if we can come ahead on it, it's, it's, it's something that we can't just file away and, and, and disregard. Just because somebody can't afford insurance doesn't mean that they shouldn't shouldn't be able to have a surgery or life-saving event. At the same time, I think we should keep efficiencies within the system uh, monitored because there there is abuse of the system, and all around as a whole to keep it a, to keep it a healthy functioning idea and 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 a, a use for people that really need it. We need to really monitor that and keep the efficiencies there while a absolutely retaining it and expanding if it if it keeps the state ahead on the budget. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Cody. Representative Heiner, the same question. What is your position on Medicaid expansion? And please explain why. Thank you for the question. I am against uh, Medicaid expansion. The numbers I've seen sh show that it would raise the cost for Wyoming by as much as $30 million. And that's money that we haven't budgeted for. We'd have to find that money somewhere. And in the last few years, we have heard a lot about uh, raising taxes on everyone. I think we've all felt the, the increased fees that are coming about from the state. Uh, our license plate fees have gone up. Our property taxes have gone up. All of the fees that we, we pay to the state have gone up. So what, where would that extra $30 million come from? I believe that we, we the federal government uses purse strings to influence and control the states and they use that money as a carrot out there to try to get us to, to do their bid and calling. I do not agree with fed federal overreach and particularly in the Medicaid expansion ring. Thank you Representative Heiner and finally to JT Larson, what is your position on Medicaid expansion and please explain why. I definitely think there needs to be a review on Medicaid expansion to look at the budget impact for the state. Um, but while we also look at that, we also need to talk about the question of are we also taking care of our veterans and their health? Um, they are definitely uh, a very important part of our society, especially here in Wyoming, and um, I feel that they're not being taken care of. So um, that's definitely something that we need to look at as well. Thank you. JT, let me follow on, if I may, and getting back to Representative Heiner talking about strings attached to federal monies, would there be any strings attached to Medicaid expansion that you would absolutely not support? Definitely think that we shouldn't um, take any uh, money that would allow the government to control the people of Wyoming. Um, so that's where I stand on that. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Let's move along to round number three. Let me begin with Representative Stith. Sir, would you be in favor of changing the tax structure for the renewable energy uh, and why? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So what's puzzling about how renewable energy works right now is that there is, uh, we have a tax on the production of wind, en wind energy, so it's a dollar a megawatt that gets charged. It's the tax they pay for the production of electricity uh, through wind turbines. But solar energy, uh, it's zero. Uh, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me that we would treat it in a differential way. Uh, we also uh, tax uh, through uh, severance and ad valorem uh, taxes. We also tax the, the fossil fuel industries very heavily. So I'd be in favor of uh, certainly equalizing the solar energy uh, component of that because I don't think we should be discriminating uh, you know, in favor of solar as, as in favor of wind, for example. Representative Stith, if I could follow on with that, another question. Do you think it's equitable right now as far as the taxation or lack thereof of uh, 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 nuclear power and uranium mined in Wyoming? Well, thank, you. thank you so much for the question. So we just recently 
uh, passed uh, a bill that would make it possible for the Natrium Power Plant in Kemmer, which is a, will be a great project. I mean, that's going to save the city, the town of Kemmer. It really will. And it's a good project. It's going to bring a lot of jobs to southwest Wyoming. It's also going to help Rock Springs. Uh, we're going to see additional sales tax uh, as if they have their equipment dropped off at our local freight yard. Uh, Sweetwater County is going to end up collecting the tax for that. So nuclear energy was taxed at $5 a megawatt, which makes it prohibitively expensive. That just got repealed down to zero. Uh, I think taking it from five to $5 was too high, but when this last session, when we took it from $5 to $0, I think zero is too low. I think if we're going to have a dollar a megawatt or $2 a megawatt fee on wind and solar, uh, we should make that for nuclear as well so that it's even across the board. Thank you, Representative Stith. Let me next come to Bob Davis. Sir, would you be in favor of changing the tax structure for the renewable energy industry and why? Yes, I believe it would be a good thing to increase the tax structure on renewable energy. Uh, the one thing that, that really kind of sticks out to me is that these carbon credits or the renewable credits that are being used there are at the not at the source. Wyoming gets zero for generating all this green energy, you know. Why don't we get them so that we can offset some of our carbon footprint, for instance. And then uh, also, you know, with this wind energy, there's the, if you've driven into Cheyenne lately in the night, you think you're going into a UFO landing strip. So there's some cosmetic, you know, visions there that we need to look at here. But I am definitely in favor of, more taxes on green energy. Very good. Cody Wiley, coming your way. I'm sure you can imagine the question. Would you be in favor of changing the tax structure for the renewable energy industry and why? Absolutely. Energy is a commodity, and it doesn't matter if it's burning coal in a power plant or, or natural gas or wind or solar. Everything should be taxed. Everything should pull its fair weight. Um, if we're going to utilize it in the state of Wyoming, we, we should get our fair share of the revenues from that. Wind is highly subsidized. It, it uh, is shown not to be the most efficient green energy. Solar is, is so new that we're, we're still figuring out how to tax it and stuff. But I think across the board, we should, we, should, uh, we should tax everything because, like I said again, energy is a commodity, and Wyoming should have its fair share for its citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. And same question, Representative Heiner. As we've heard here from, from Representative Stiff, the tax structure is very convoluted. We're picking winners and lose, losers via a tax. Solar tax is, has, is non-existent. There's no tax whatsoever on a solar farm. Wind, as, as Representative Stiff said, has a dollar. Uh, nuclear had five dollars. And this first nuclear plant is exempt, but thereafter that five dollars is still on the books. Coal and natural gas are heavily taxed with the severance taxes and all the other taxes. I think we need to, to step back a little bit and look at our tax structure. What I would like to do is tax power as it leaves the state boundary, right at the, at the state lines. Tax, an export tax, per se. Don't tax anything that we're consuming here in, in Wyoming, but as it goes outside of the state, tax it all the same, no matter whether it comes from solar, wind, hydropower, whatever the source may be, tax it all equally so we don't pick winners and losers through legislation. Very good. Thank you, Representative Heiner. Finally, to J.T. Larson, same question. Would you be in favor of changing the tax structure for renewable energy and why? Thank you. I definitely think that we need to review the tax structure on renewal, renewable energy. Uh, we need to make it equitable, equitable across the board to provide a fair playing field for energy generation for um, the various businesses of energy generation. Thank you. JT, let me keep it right there if I could. And let's begin round four with yourself. What is your position on red flag laws and please explain why? My position on red flag laws is they shouldn't exist in Wyoming. Um, the second amendment is it clearly states our rights and um, I think that every Wyomingite should be able to carry a gun if they choose so. Very good. Representative Heiner, what is your position on red flag laws? And also please explain why. So 
Fortunately, with the, the latest legislation from the federal government, it allows the states to impose or not to choose to impose red flag laws. But here again, they put money out there to entice us to do so. I will resist strongly any, any efforts to impose red flag, additional red flag laws upon our citizens in Wyoming. We already have a lot of background checks and things that if, if utilized properly, should be able to help uh, with this situation. But our biggest problem, I think, with some of the, the things that have happened in the, in the past f few years here in the United States, mental health needs to be addressed. And some of these individuals are doing some bad things because they are not receiving the mental health uh, help that they need. So I will strongly resist additional red flag laws, but I think we need to look at better better help for those that need mental health assistance. Thank you, Representative. Let me pose the same question to Cody Wiley. What is your position on red flag laws? And please explain. Yes, absolutely not. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the Second Amendment. I will put my knife in the ground and defend it. I believe that um, it, was, it was stated in the Constitution and meant for us to, to be able to bear arms. Red flag laws are fundamentally flawed. Um, we need to look at mental health. We need to look at some of the societal problems we have right now. We need to look at polarization. There, there are so many other things that, that, that we need to work on before we, we just want to take away somebody's rights or infringe upon them that uh, I believe it's just, it's just not even a discussion at this point, and I would, I would go down with, with the Second Amendment right on top. Thank you. May I keep it right there, Cody, with a follow-on? You said it's fundamentally flawed. Is there one or perhaps two things that you think is most flawed about red flag laws in general? Sure. So with the red flag laws, you're talking about a court being able to take a person's firearms away from them for a certain amount of time or up to a year, I believe. Um, if this person is having a mental health breakdown or, or a rough time in life, it's not necessarily adequate just to take their, their, their arms away. You're infringing upon their rights under, under, under the United States Constitution. So I believe that, that there needs to be other ways to handle it, mental health, um, um, different, different avenues before just taking away somebody's rights, infringing upon them. And that's my belief. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Cody. Let me come next to Bob Davis. Same question, Bob. What is your position on red flag laws? And please explain why. I'm not in favor of the red flag laws at all. Uh, it seems like they're profiling uh, law-abiding citizens here. And what I understand about the red flag law, uh, as a veteran, I would qualify as a red flag. So <laughs> I think I'm a pretty good guy. I don't know if I need to be qualified as a red flag. So, And the other question I would have on that is who is going to enforce these red flag laws? Who in the, in the state of Wyoming is there? How is that going to be implemented? Thank you. Excellent questions, Bob. Finally, with Representative Stith, your position on red flag laws. And again, please explain. Thank you. I would echo the comments of Representative Heiner. Uh, so maybe let's talk about what the law already is. Um, if you are convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence, if you are a convicted felon, or if you are adjudicated mentally incompetent and sent to the state hospital in Evanston, it's already the law that you may not possess a firearm. And if any of those three events apl apply to you, then courts will take away your guns right now. That's existing law. What red flag laws do, however, is extend that into much more subjective areas. And the reason I'm against red flag laws is that they are vague, for one thing, uh, and, and standardless and there's a lack of due process uh, for the individual uh, who's, whose gun rights are being threatened. So I think existing law where we're, we're already dealing with uh, domestic violence, we're already dealing with uh, being adjudicated mentally incompetent, we're already dealing with convicted felons, I think that goes far enough. So I would not be in favor of expanding any uh, restrictions on uh, a resident's gun rights. Thank you, Representative Stith. And as we get into round five, sir, if I could keep it right there with Representative Stith. And the next line of questioning, sir, how would you handle the monetary shortfall for education in the state? Thank you. Well, here's the, the short-term good news on K-12 education. We do have a very expensive K-12 system. 
Uh, it's funded through what's called the School Foundation Program. When commodity prices are high, uh, those funds tend to be flush. Uh, we put in two provisions in this latest budget bill, Sections 314 and Section 315, which for the first time allocate a portion of the severance tax on coal, oil, gas, and trona to go to the school foundation program. So our structural deficit, so to speak, in K-12, through which was at $250 million, we've whittled that down to uh, something under $50 million at this point. And the good news is we've created a backstop through the uh, Legislative Stabilization Reserve Account so that when there is a shortfall in K-12, through it's automatically covered. So really it's what pot of money it comes out of. Uh, our, the funding for education essentially is guaranteed by our state constitution right now. So to some extent, uh, we don't have a shortfall in funding education. Uh, the money is there. Uh, so I would not be in favor of increasing uh, sales tax, for example, for that. And I do have a plan for reducing your sales tax, which I hope to be able to talk about later. Thank you, Representative. Same question to Bob Davis. Sir, how would you handle the monetary shortfall for education in the state? Well, what I, what little I do know about this, uh, it seems that uh, over 50% of the state's budget is dedicated to education and the implementation of it. You know, the surrounding states, uh, I think we're right at 16000 or $18,000 per student to educate them. Surrounding states are doing it for less. Uh, are we getting our best bang for our buck? You know, uh, but I think the best thing that we need to probably look at is the modeling, how they're putting this together and figuring out how we're funding that. If we can revisit that and uh, make some adjustments, perhaps we can get some better results. Perhaps so. Bob, can I keep it right there for a follow-on? Wyoming spends more per capita on education than just about any other state. A large part of that is on transportation. Would you support a four-day school week for the state? Coincidentally, we have a four-day school week in our valley. So apparently I do support it. <laughs> <laughs> what goes on in the valley may not resonate in Cheyenne. I just I wanted to know. have you on the record for that. But no, it, it, it seems to be good for the students. They, they put in a little extra hours a little extra time to make up that, that last day. And that last day predominantly, if you're into sports or anything like that, is usually on the road going someplace. So that still frees that time up for them students, but it doesn't affect their education. Very good. Same question to Cody Wiley. Cody, how would you handle the monetary shortfall for education in the state? Well, I believe education is vitally important to the state, and I believe that we need to continue support of it. But my whole platform is, is economic diversification and growth. And I believe the state needs to quit um, relying on the, uh, the old ways of the boom and the bust. And every time it busts, we're in, we're in dire straits for everything, ambulance services, uh, education. So we need to start investing some of, some of our monies in, in, into new industry, not just the, the old diehard oil, gas, trona, and coal. And if we do that, I believe that we can, we can bridge the gap monetarily. And, and our funding issues will help take care of themselves because we will have more revenue from the industry growth than, than we do now, just depending on our natural resources. And with that being said, I, I believe that we could also look at efficiencies within the school system, a four-day four school week, and different things such as that to, to save money and have, have cost savings there on site for the kids while we don't sacrifice their education, because education is vital to our future. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Cody. And let me come next to Representative Heiner. Sir, how would you handle the monetary shortfall for education in Wyoming? Thank you, Johnny. One thing I want to make clear is our school districts are not having a shortfall. The legislature is finding ways to fully fund our school districts. They are not short of money in, in, any, in any fashion. In fact, the federal government recently gave all of our school districts a total of th over $300 million in addition to what the state has given our school districts. And, and because of this flush of cash, we had to raise the limit that the school district could keep in reserve up to 30%. So they're able to keep up to 30% of their budget in reserve now. So we are continuing to find ways to fund our schools. Education is very important to us. But Johnny, you brought up transportation and I'm gonna bring that up because hopefully I'll, you may not ask me that question. I, I sat uh, 
in a school district, not this one here and not in southwest Wyoming, but one morning I saw 14 buses bumper to bumper going by to the very picking up different kids for different schools, different age groups, 14 buses. Our transportation is, is fully reimbursed at 100% by the state. So there is no incentive for a school district, school district to be efficient with their transportation. And that's an inherent problem. We need to be more controlling in our... It, re representative, Representative, uh, I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming back to you because actually I've, I've posed bonus questions to all of the candidates. So since we're on that subject, let me just ask you quite simply, how would you propose addressing that? So right now it's, it's reimbursed 100%. I think there needs to be some oversight. We need to go to our, to our uh, uh, school boards and ask them to control the budget a little bit better than what they've been doing. And I'm not spe speaking at one school board versus another school board, but as a state whole, our school boards are ones that decide where that money's being spent. And transportation is, is just a uh, blank check right now. So if you have 14 buses bumper to bumper, maybe there's a little bit of enhancement that we could make on that and be more efficient on that because you, you're saving the state's money, which in turn means you're saving us as citizens of the state money by being more efficient. So there, there are opportunities. And I do not like the legislature to force that. That should be a local control. Representative, thank you. And finally, let me pose that question to J.T. Larson. J.T., how would you handle the monetary shortfall for education in the state? I agree um, really uh, closely with uh, Cody Wiley here. Um, we need, definitely need to look at diversifying our economy, and I think Sweetwater County is a, a great powerhouse for um, Wyoming's economic diversification. We have um, vast open spaces for different uh, industries to come in and um, support our tax revenue for the state and the county. Um, I think we need to uh, do, if, if we do this, um, our state will be flush with cash and we can um, uh, definitely um, make sure education is funded. Um, but one thing we have to be careful of is we tend to get a bunch of money and then spend it all. So why not think about putting some away? And I think I think the state does pretty well with that, but um, also looking at it um, closely, closer and uh, um, putting more money away um, than we already do. Thank you, and that brings us to round six. Let me begin with Bob Davis. Bob, your opponent, Clyde Johnson, was able to be with us tonight, and therefore your House District 47 debate was canceled. Will you share with us why people should vote for you for House District 47 next Tuesday? Oh, as I pointed out earlier in, in my opening statements, I believe in giving back to the community, and I've been very active in our community over there for the past 35 years. Um, there just about isn't anything that I haven't participated in over there, so I've, my knowledge has grown with that, and uh, I think I've got the skills to deal with the needs of House District 47. There's oh, 14 different communities in there with 14 different needs. And with my background in uh, the oil and gas industry, the plumbing industry, uh, as a problem solver and a job creator, I think I can bring some leadership in there. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And the next four candidates, this is the same question to close it out. Uh, you're all unopposed in the Republican primary election. Will you look to face one or more opponents in the general election? As a Republican, why are you the right choice for each of your House districts? Let me begin with J.T. Larson. Thank you. I'm the right choice uh, for my district, I think, because I um, have spent a lot of time working for the people of Sweetwater County, even though it's been short. Um, I'm eager to get out there and... Uh, support everybody here. Um, my campaign slogan is serving Sweetwater, representing you. So uh, thank you and for the question. Thank you. Representative Heiner, why are you the right choice for your house district? Thank you, Johnny. Wyoming is overwhelmingly Republican. Uh, 
uh, supermajority Republican state, one of the most supermajority of any of the states in the union. And yet, it, until this last session, we were never able to pass an anti-abortion bill. Never. Why is that? We didn't pass the crossover bill to prohibit crossover voting. We didn't pass a uh, bill to prohibit CRT, critical race theory. We didn't pass a bill to prohibit transgenders from competing in women's sports. We have a lot of work yet to do. We need some more conservative voices in Cheyenne, and I bring one of those conservative voices. I am inherently conservative, and I will stand for the conservatism that Wyoming represents, that our good citizens expect from our legislature in Wyoming. Thank you. Thank you. Cody, what makes you the right choice for your house district? Well, Johnny, this wasn't an easy decision for me. It's not the easy road. I, I didn't just do this for, for pomp or prestige. Uh, as a third generation businessman in, in construction, I see the shortfalls in Sweetwater and Wyoming every year. I see other, other counties around the state uh, building factories and, and um, stoking the growth of the private industry. And I, I just believe the Sweetwater Sweetwater is falling short and that we don't have a united voice coming coming from Sweetwater to Cheyenne. And at the state level, I think we need, we need a more profound voice together with the same ideals. My conservative beliefs will help me continue to do the right thing. And um, I think I can get us with my experience pushed in the right direction and, and have, a, have a unified voice coming out of Sweetwater in Cheyenne. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. And finally, Representative Stith, aside from your affinity for fine British motorcycles, why are you the right choice for House District 48? Thank you so much. It, is, it has been such an honor and a privilege to serve in the Wyoming State Legislature. I, I live and breathe the State Legislature. I, I really love it. It's, I feel like that's what I'm made to do. Uh, the, our state will be facing a lot of challenges. Twenty years from now, our fossil fuels industry could look very different than it does today. And we've got to make sure that we are ready for it and that the people of our state and that the city of Rock Springs is going to be healthy 10, 20, 30 years from now. How do we do that? Uh, when it comes to economic development, what matters most for economic development over the long run is the promotion of ideas and technology, which is why I'm a big supporter of the Wyoming Innovation Partnership. We put $55 million into that. That's having an impact right here at our community college and right here in our community. I believe that we need to have a balanced approach to make sure that we have a healthy community. We have a lot of uh, it's a beautiful community we have here, but we also have a lot of things to work on. Uh, we have certainly mental health issues to work on. I look forward to working on, on those things. Uh, we put some money into uh, making sure that our suicide hotline it works 24-7 here in Wyoming. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, and I, I would just be honored and privileged to, to be sent back to, uh, again, to Cheyenne to represent the people of Rock Springs and north of Rock Springs. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. And let's begin, or I should say, let's, uh, let's close out our, uh, our discussion this evening, closing statements, and let me begin with Bob Davis. Closing statements. I've never had to give one of them. Uh, I don't really uh, know what to tell you. <laughs> I have... Can you come back to me on this one? Sure, Bob. Let me right. circle back on that to uh, quote our vice president. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, J.T. Larson, two minutes on the clock. Thank you so much. Former President Thomas Jefferson once said, we do not have government by the majority. We have government by the majority who participate. Thank you all for coming out to listen this evening. If you have more questions about my campaign, you can find me in the lobby afterwards or my website is www.electjtlarson.com. You may also contact me via email at jt at electjtlarson.com or my cell phone, 307-389-0162. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you, JT. Next, let's hear from Scott Heiner. Honey, I want to salute those that are in attendance here or watching on, on YouTube, you are the real patriots in this state. 
You are the defenders of liberty and freedom in the Constitution by your attendance and your involvement in government, and I salute you. You're my heroes. I appreciate the opportunity which I've had to represent you, and I look forward to being able to do that in the future. We have some unfinished, biz unfinished business yet, and I've, I enumerated a few of those in my last comments. This election is vital for the state of Wyoming. As we have crossover voting happening, uh, we, we know they're happening uh, at unprecedented levels right now. It's going to influence some of these closes, close races within the state on the local levels. As we have moderates and Democrats switching into the Republican primary, they're going to vote for the less conservative people. And those close races, may, we may lose some conservative voice because of that. Stand up. Let's stand up together and let's vote together. Let's vote for the most conservative representatives and candidates we can find. And, and I appreciate your research to find those conservative candidates because this is what our elections is all about, choosing the best one that represents you according to what you feel is most important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Next, I want to hear from Cody Wiley. Yes, <clears throat> With over a decade in construction management, the education that Wyoming has for provided me, a year and a half with the planning and zoning at Rock Springs as vice chair, I believe I can contribute to the state and the county that I love. I've chosen to start and raise my family here, grow my family business, give back to our communities. I want to defend our way of life that is so special and unique to Wyoming and Sweetwater County. Others cannot understand what it's like to love the smell of sage after a southern uh, summer rain. <clears throat> a, trip into the, a trip into the hills with no one else in sight, or the first warm day of spring after a brutal Wyoming winter. I promise I will stick to our conservative values, responsible spending, efficiency in our systems and projects. Roll back the red tape in Cheyenne so local companies can flourish while keeping responsible practices toward our wide open spaces with all the wildlife that depend on it. I will fight to keep our coal mines open, our pump jacks pumping, and I will push to use natural gas as a green energy source. At the same time, I will push for economic reform, diversification, and development. We need to foster more private sector growth so we can keep taxes low while maintaining our way of life and have good paying jobs. As a younger man, I was told everything you do, you put your name on. Well, I have decided to put my name on it. I will try like hell not only to help Wyoming, but the residents in Sweetwater County. I believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Let us not let fear deter the bright future Wyoming has in store. I ask once again, let's roll up our sleeves and fight for Wyoming and Sweetwater County. Vote for Wiley. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Cody. And next, if we could hear from Clark Stith. Thank you. I certainly want to, I want to thank all of you who are here live in the audience tonight. You could have spent your Wednesday evening doing any number of other things that would have been more interesting to you, I'm sure. But thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it because politics can be an honorable thing. It can be. And you're the ones who hold us to account and make that possible because politics is, after all, uh, how we get things done. And it can be uh, a productive good thing. Uh, you know, Greek philosophers said that you find happiness when you make the full use of your powers in the pursuit of excellence. And that's why I would like to continue in the Wyoming legislature because it gives an opportunity to, to use uh, what skills I have to try to, to fix problems, problems that affect uh, your lives. And I would like the opportunity to continue doing that. Uh, and let me talk about one specific thing that uh, affects each of us each day. Uh, we all know that the price of uh, gas and diesel is extremely high. Our commodity prices are high. Because we're an oil and gas producing state, it means that the government actually gets rich while people on the ground pay more. I think we can do something to alleviate the pain that people on the street suffer. And we can do that by having a dynamic sales tax because every $10 increase in the price of a barrel of oil results in another $100 million to the state. Half a penny of sales tax generates about $90 million. So if commodity prices are high, we should be able to reduce the state sales tax by a half penny so that instead of paying five cents, you're paying four and a half cents. That way, put some more money back in your pocket. Practical things like that, I think, can make the state a better place and keep us 
stable in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. Rob, we're ready for you. Bob? Okay. Uh, I give it some thought now, okay? Uh, one of the many jobs that I uh, enjoy is a bartender at the Cowboy Inn in Bags, Wyoming. And uh, I, I get to deal with a lot of the public there, young and old. And one thing that I've seen across the spectrum is that the pushback against what is being shoved down our our throats, you know. And uh, so I believe that there, there's hope for us. And uh, I believe in America. And I think it's going to be a strong America going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. I imagine you learn a lot behind the bar, and I mean no disrespect by that. The Union Bar in Hudson, there was always some great conversation with one of our elected officials. There's various stages of intelligence during the night. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking these gentlemen for joining us on the stage this evening. Now to my friend Bruce Pivick, please mark your calendar. Two things happened that don't normally happen when you and I work together. Number one, we're on the time, and number two, I effectively quoted the Vice President. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a, a ten-minute break, and we'll roll on through the evening with Sweetwater County House District 60 debate.
And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, those of you joining us tonight from the beautiful Broadway Theater in Rock Springs and those watching online via YO4 News. We're ready to move on for the next, uh, next uh, discussion of the evening. Covering House District 60 Green River, we welcome Jennifer Janes and Tony Nemec. First and foremost, I want to welcome the candidate Jennifer James. She's been a registered Republican in Sweetwater County for almost a year. And also candidate Tony Nemec, who has been registered as a Republican in Sweetwater County for 14 years. There is no Republican incumbent for the House District 60 race. And let's begin with opening statements and two minutes on the clock. Kel, let's hear first from Tony Nemec. Thank you, Sweetwater County GOP, Wild 4 News, Bruce Pivick, and Johnny Kay for hosting this debate. My name is Tony Nemec. I'm a 46-year resident of Green River. I graduated from Green River High School in 1987, and the day after graduation began 13 years of service with the United States Marine Corps. Upon my honorable discharge from the Marines, I returned to Green River and began my career with the Sweetwater County Sheriff's Office, where I'm currently serving. I volunteer countless hours at several nonprofit organizations in town and in the county, like the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and the Marine Corps League. I am also a small business owner, so my ties to our community run deep. I want to be your representative for House District 60, as I believe that those who represent us should be invested in the community. I would appreciate your vote at the primary election on August 16th. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Next, I'd like to hear from Jennifer James. Thank you. I'm Jennifer James, owner of a nonprofit healthcare training company. I registered as a Republican in Wyoming in 2016 after moving to Laramie County from Illinois, where I was also a Republican. I married one year ago and moved to Green River. I'm running for House District 60 because I'm dedicated to serving the people. The position of House Rep is responsible for creating common sense laws for all of Wyoming, not simply Green River. So a broad knowledge base, experience, and ability to foresee consequences is important in this position. My formal education includes a doctoral degree and several master's degrees, one in law. I currently attend the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, completing a graduate certificate in public policy and design. I'm passionate about evidence-based processes I'll utilize science, not opinions, when deciding issues. I have much experience in policy and rulemaking because I was formerly employed by two state agencies. I helped write draft bills and testified on several topics. I was respected for my knowledge and developed friendly relationships with seated members and lobbyists. Mainly, I would like to see more deliberate decision making in the legislative body. I'll be your representative dedicated to investigating the future effects of proposed legislation. I'm an academic, a researcher, a collaborator, and I think out of the box. I also have the time and resources to study the issues brought forward. My first goal is to learn the budget and the rules for our legislative process. It's important to have a strong foundation. I don't accept funds from PAC because I only work for you. I look forward to tonight's debate. Thank you, Jennifer, and a rare commodity you are, a Republican from the People's Republic of Illinois. <laughs> Jennifer, let me keep it right there, if I could, with a first question. If elected, what strengths would you bring to the office, and what are your weaknesses, if any? Um, thank you. So my strengths are um, definitely my ability to uh, research topics and um, think about things in a logical fashion. Um, there are consequences to anything we do in the legislature, uh, far-reaching consequences. So we need to, for, um, you know, foresee those um, down the road. Another piece is that I have established relationships already at the Capitol, having volunteered there for many years and um, testifying on other bills and issues. Um, I have experience in writing bill drafts. And that takes a, a special talent as well. So some of my weaknesses also, Johnny? If any. If any. No, I don't have any weaknesses. <laughs> Very good. Tony, you and I were both in the Marine Corps, and the question I hated most going before a board is your weaknesses. And this is the first time I've got to ask that question <laughs> of a fellow Marine. 
Tony Nemec, if elected, what strengths do you bring to the office and what are your weaknesses, if any? Thank you. I, I believe my strengths, you know, I've worked 34 years in government, last 20 years enforcing state statutes, so I know what the statutes read, what they should read, and the problems with them. Um, as far as weaknesses, not going to give it. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Let me keep it right there if I could. Tony, what is your position on red flag laws, and please explain why. I am completely against red flag laws. It takes away due process, and we cannot have that. I don't care how much money they dangle in front of the government of the state of Wyoming. I'm against it. Thank you. Jennifer James, same question. What is your position on red flag laws? And also please explain why. Thank you. So absolutely against red flag laws. Um, you know, uh, in your folder you might have picked up, I have placed the uh, Enrolled Act for SAPA and then the other act um, that was not passed. Um, Wyoming could have averted federal red flag laws um, by passing SF0087 instead of 102 last year. This SAPA bill was 17 pages of extensive protections for Wyoming citizens and covered all anticipated federal movements, including confiscation of weapons. The SAPA bill that was passed um, does not protect us against federal dollars being used for enforcing federal laws in this regard. We need to amend the SAPA Enrolled Act immediately, and I'm happy to offer the appropriate language. Thank you, ma'am. Tony, let me come back to you. Sir, what is your position on Medicaid expansion, and please explain why. Well, I honestly believe that Medicaid needs to be expanded, but I don't believe we have the funding available. We definitely need to look into it. I'm open to look into it. Um, but I've heard so much about the funding and how much, how expensive it's going to be that right now I'm not sold on it. Very good. Jennifer James, same question. What is your position on Medicaid expansion? And also please explain why. Thank you. I am not a fan of Medicaid expansion. At this point, the uh, Department of Health has, um, analyzed data for probably since 2013 and every year that data is variable they change it um, in your folder I do have their last report so they don't have it locked down as to how many new enrollees will there actually be it varies from 19,000 to 50,000 they don't know um, the other piece is you know until they get that narrow down properly, then we can talk about it. The other piece is that there are other models in other states. Oregon had um, kind of a lottery system that worked on enrolling and it helped their budget overall. Now I do agree that I, 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 I wish everybody could have health insurance, but this is a huge impact to the state unless we are careful in um, how we open an enrollment. Very good. Jennifer, let me keep it right there, if I may. Next series of questions, if elected, would you ever vote to diminish the protections of qualified immunity? And again, please explain. I, I don't understand the question. Would you ever vote to diminish the protections of qualified immunity? And please explain. Yeah, I'll have to pass on that one. I don't have an example. Very good. Uh, same question, Tony, if elected, would you ever vote to diminish the protections of qualified immunity? And if you would, please explain. Absolutely not. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll go into it. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is qualified immunity applies to all government employees. But law enforcement is being targeted. So if you want to get rid of it, get rid of it for all. Those snowplow operators, those prosecutors, judges. So. But they're targeting my fellow law enforcement officers. I will not support that. Very good. Thank you, Tony. Jennifer James, if I could come back to you. Next question. How would you handle the monetary shortfall for education in the state? So 
um, the shortfall, again, as the former panel said, is not as bad as it used to be. There was $300 million passed out um, from the ARPA funds. Um, I checked with Sweetwater District 2 recently over the summer, and I did notice that they had $16 million in their investment account. Um, and I know that's allowed, but perhaps um, the other counties, the other school districts have similar large amount of in their in their investments and are they being invested to their full potential so that's my question there um, as you heard from the previous panelists we're highly uh, funded in the entire education system so I think better utilization is probably necessary um, a lot of people look at the high salaries of the top leaders of the administrators, and that might be an issue that we should probably take a look at. Very good. Thank you. Same question, Tony Nemec. How would you handle the monetary shortfall for education in the state? Well, as we heard earlier during the last panel, it doesn't seem like there is one, but uh, probably the, some of the money is not sp being spent wisely. Uh, if you look around the state, Sweetwater County has two school districts. If they're getting an equal amount of the pie, Maybe we need two school districts, but there's other counties like Fremont. They have six to nine, I believe, school districts for a county with half the population. So maybe we could look into that, maybe combine some school districts if there is a shortfall. Very good. Tony, let me keep it right there if I could. Next series of questions. Having lived in Green River for the last 46 years, that is currently House District 60, why are you the right choice to represent the constituents of House District 60? As you said, I've lived there for 46 years. It's my home. I'm your neighbor. You all know me. You know what I stand for, what I'm about. Um, I'm not going to move away. <laughs> if I lose this election and find some other place to live. Uh, like I said, you all know me. I'm here for you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Similar question to Jennifer James, having lived in House District 60 for less than a year, how can you know the needs of the constituents of the district and why are you the right choice to properly represent them? Thank you, I, and I am fortunate to live here now um, moving to Wyoming was the best decision ever. I've been to all 49 of 50 states. I've been to about 40 other countries. I'm well-traveled. I did some policy work when I did uh, live in Illinois, and I definitely love Wyoming because I want to get away from that type of environment. I love our conservatism. Um, I am definitely not leaving Green River. Um, unless I get married again, which that's doubtful. <laughs> but thank you. That may be the most contentious <laughs> statement made tonight. <laughs> and for full disclosure, I also hail from the land of Lincoln. Let me keep it right there, Jennifer, in a two-minute closing statement. Thank you. I've helped my seated officials previously with health care and social policy decisions. I hope to be placed on committees where my educational background and 35 years of experience will support effective decision making. Many are concerned with problems in our education system. I've been evaluating school safety policies and I have met with Sweetwater District 2 leaders on a few occasions this summer. I understand our local issues and will decide collaboratively if a bill draft might be needed next session. In the past, I helped write bill drafts related to school safety, health care, and long-term care visitation rights. I, do not, I did not support mask mandates or forced vaccines as these were unconstitutional. I'm prepared to offer the proper language to update the Second Amendment Preservation Act to make certain Wyoming is protected from the federal interference and our gun rights are secure. I hope my constituents will place their trust in me and my abilities to make sound decisions. I will reach out to the people I represent in all manners so I can communicate your concerns, ideas, and present our needs to the body. I want to be certain to vote by the desires of my Green River neighbors. I'm the best qualified candidate for House of Representatives because my extensive experience, formal education in policy, design, and law, and my ability to place my business and personal family life aside while I do your work. 
I'm the only candidate for House District 60 endorsed by the Wyoming Right to Life Organization. I promise to uphold the U.S. and Wyoming constitutions first and foremost. I'm a staunch Republican and will support the platform voted upon by all Wyoming Republicans. I humbly ask for your support in our primary election. Thank you, Jennifer. And finally, a two-minute closing statement from Tony Nemec. Thank you again, Sweetwater GOP, Wild 4 News, Bruce Pivick, Johnny Kay for hosting this debate. As someone who's been a resident of Green River for pretty much all my life and invested so much in our community, I want to thank you for your vote on August 16th. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our candidates this evening, Jennifer James and Tony Nemec. And stay tuned. We'll have a brief intermission, about 10 minutes. We'll welcome Larry Hicks to the stage, and we'll close this evening with Tom James and Stacy Jones. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, those joining us in person at the beautiful Broadway Theater in Rock Springs and those online via YO4 News. Coming up shortly, we'll visit with our candidates for the Sweetwater County Senate District 13. Uh, right now, Senate District 11 address as we welcome Senator Larry Hicks. Yeah, thank you. Just as an introductory statement, I have had the honor and the privilege to serve in the uh, 
senator in Senate District 11 for three years, or three terms, 12 years, and in all that entire time, I've represented about a third of Sweetwater County, primarily the smaller towns, the Farson Eden, Wom Sutter, um, Superior area, uh, and it's been a, one of the greatest honors in my life to have the ability to serve the people of Sweetwater and Carbon County. Prior to redistricting, it included part of uh, Albany County. Senate District 11, the largest Senate district as far as land mass in the lower 48. Um, it runs from the Sublette County line all the way into Albany County. Uh, with the redistricting, it's now about 16 different communities that, that I have an opportunity to represent, but I can't tell you the privilege it is to be able to sit in the Wyoming legislature and represent the state and the people in this district. And so with that, again, um, I'm running unopposed. Um, I look forward to a, four more years of an opportunity to serve you, the people of Senate District 11 and the people of Wyoming. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, folks. The challenges aren't over. Um, anyway. That'll be my introductory statement. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Visiting earlier, he said, I'm just going to keep my microphone on. I don't want my opponents to get a word in edgewise. <laughs> a seasoned veteran. Let's continue. Senator Hicks, what is the value of civility in the Senate and why? Seizures because we are the most Republican state in the nation, bar none, and we're a very conservative state. We should also be a leader in all things when it comes to government, smaller, fiscal, conservative, and we should also be a leader on how we govern. It's as important as to what we govern. And so I think when we show the ability to work across party lines and, and work within differences within the Republican Party, it really demonstrates the value of the people of the state of Wyoming. Uh, it's the way I was raised in this state for my and I disagree, I, I will tend and absolutely strive not to be disagreeable. And I think you build coalitions, you build a responsive government, and you have a true government that represents the people. Because I know for a fact, the people that I have had an opportunity to represent, that we don't always agree. We don't have to be disagreeable, and we can get a lot of things done, even when working with people that we don't agree with all the time. So civility is tremendously important. Very good. Give me one moment, please. Senator, we just want to make sure we can hear you in this building and online as clearly as possible. All right. That better? Test? There we go. Test? Test? Bruce, thank you. And Senator, I apologize. The next question, Senator Hicks, what does it mean to you to be a conservative? You know, I go back and I trace the values and, and where conservatives have come from. It's a, it's a really cheap terminology the way it's thrown out there now. Um, but you have to go back to the foundations and where it come from. And for me, I've traced the values of conservative principles all the way back to the Bible. They're biblical. And you translate that through some of the great Greek philosophers all, these, all the way up through the British Parliament with Sir Edmund Burke as probably one of the classic uh, uh, Locke who wrote the two treaties of government that our founders were well versed in, in, in reading and understanding. It's about a set of, set of values. It's about a set of values and principles. Um, and their core fundamental things that this country was founded on is those conservative values and principles. More than anything else, I think it, 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 it has got a connotation that it's a political philosophy now. I think it's a philosophy in life. And uh, it's how we treat our neighbors, it's how we govern, and it's how we should strive as to always follow those conservative traditional principles that we were brought up with what this country was founded on, and what has just made us great as a country, a state, and a county. That's conservatism. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Larry, I'd like to talk about Senate File 102. What is it, and why did you sponsor it? So Senate File 
102 was the Second Amendment Preservation Act, and as the, one of the previous debates talked about, uh, there was another bill out there, and I thought it was interesting that uh, one of the respondents was, 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 would you vote to get rid of qualified immunity? So what qualified immunity is, is protects your peace officers uh, in the line of their duty. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Nimick did a very good job explaining that. So. Senate File 102 was designed to be as a constitutional bill that passes the muster, and so it was predicated on the anti-commandeering do doctrine that's been before the Supreme Court seven times as to how, and it goes back and translates back to the Federalist Papers and Federalist 56. James Madison said the federal government will get out of control, and this is how you rein in the federal government. Senate File 102 was predicated on Federalist 56 that James Madison said. It was predicated on five Supreme Court cases is how we're gonna fight the federal government. It will meet the constitutional test. It protects qualified immunity. It was done with a coalition of law enforcement, was endorsed by the Sheriffs and Chiefs Association, every sheriff in the state of Wyoming, Gun Owners of America, Shooting Sports Foundation, Supermajority of Republicans in both houses, the only people that voted against it were the Democrats and a couple of folks that just get their marching orders from somebody else that don't represent the people of the state of Wyoming. It's a truly constitutional bill that protects your Second Amendment rights, and it will stand the litmus test of a Supreme Court challenge. Thank you, Senator. Also, if reelected, you're in line to move up in the Senate leadership. Would you expound on any leadership goals? I have no goals to be in leadership. None whatsoever. I've never aspired to be in leadership. I was asked to run for leadership. Uh, I have, in my entire career, worked to work with people. Um, I was part of the coalition. The Senate wasn't always the most conservative body in the Wyoming legislature. In the 12 years I've been here, when we went in, it was reversed, and, and I worked with the coalition moderate Republicans, moderates that lean, lean right, right conservatives to put together a conservative coalition. We've taken this general fund budget from a $3.4 billion, $3 billion budget with the leadership of the Senate and the colleagues that I've worked with down to a $2.9 billion in the last 12 years. We've exercised fiscal conservatives and we've done that through building coalitions to get things done not to go down to Cheyenne and tear government down, but to go down and govern for the people of the state of Wyoming. I don't seek leadership. I was asked to go into leadership, and if asked again, I will fulfill that responsibility, but I have no ambitions to be in the leadership role. Very good. Thank you, Senator. And before I move on to my final question, I'd like to remind everybody here about the standards of decorum and decency. This may be the most contentious question I ask, particularly of Senator Hicks. Senator, have you ever worn a tie with your cowboy boots? Have I ever what? Have you ever worn a tie with your cowboy boots? No. This was submitted by some rabble rouser no. in the audience. <laughs> Senator John Cole. I have, I, I have no knowledge of what the question is. I'm sure there's something in there that, uh, but uh, I'm well, going to. Senator Cole, as you know, know, is a rabble rouser. So I'm just going to exercise my constitutional duties and take the Fifth Amendment right now. <laughs> we have a recent president that just did that, by the way. Senator Hicks, if I could have or offer you two minutes in a closing statement. You know, in closing, I would just tell you, um, it's been a journey, folks. Fourteen years. Looking at my last term, I'm not going to run again. What an opportunity. I love this state. That's why I did it. That's why I would do it one more term, because I love this state. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Senator. try to keep those rabble-rouser questions out from Senator Kolb. I want to thank Senator Hicks, and we'll move on to our final discussion of the evening. We'll welcome Tom James and Stacey Jones, Sweetwater County Senate District 13 debate.
Thanks for taking care of that. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll get, uh, get going with the final event of the evening in just about two minutes.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Broadway Theater in beautiful downtown Rock Springs and those watching and viewing online via Wild 4 News. Before we get into the final event of the evening, I want to remind everybody that the debates actually will continue here at the Broadway Friday evening. Brought to you by the uh, Rock Springs Chamber of Commerce, we'll have the mayoral debates and also the city council deba uh, debates, and that will be uh, live streamed once again on Wild 4 News. Finally, this evening, Senate District 13 debate. Tom James versus Stacy Jones. And let me set the stage, if I may, as we welcome our candidates. The incumbent is Senator Tom James, currently the senator for Senate District 13. He is seeking re-election and has been registered as a Republican in Sweetwater County for four years. Challenger is Stacy Jones, candidate for Senate District 13, registered Republican in Sweetwater County for 26 years. And with the opening statements, let me begin with Stacy Jones. Thank you to the Sweetwater GOP, Bruce Pivick, YO4 News, Johnny K, my opponent, and everyone watching tonight. I'm excited to be on track to becoming a strong voice for Sweetwater County and Cheyenne. The support has been amazing, and the overwhelming consensus is that we need a rational voice to take action. We need representation for public access and private property rights. We need a person to maintain relationships with the rest of the state. We need not only a preservation of our Second Amendment rights, but to, but to realize the value it represents to Wyoming. We need someone who recognizes the importance of extractive resources and small businesses to our economy. We need a voice of reason and an effective conservative approach. As a Wyoming native and a University of Wyoming graduate, I can accomplish those needs. I have been a resident and a registered Republican in Sweetwater County for over 25 years. My husband and I have raised our children here and are small business owners. Our businesses have fulfilled real estate and oil and gas needs for years. I am all about Wyoming and its values. I am a gun owner and come from a long line of gun owners. My family and I are outdoor enthusiasts, including hunting, fishing, boating, snowmobiling, and riding side-by-sides. We love Sweetwater County and all it has to offer. Many of you know me from the boards and the groups that I volunteer for, including the URA, the Rock Springs Chamber, Wyoming Realtors, the Sweetwater One Public School Foundation, Sweetwater Snowpokes, and the Wyoming State Snowmobile Association. For these groups, I have maintained a board presence and contributed to many successful community projects while doing so. My main and only agenda is to represent the citizens of Sweetwater County. Thank you, Stacy. And with two minutes on the clock, I'd like to hear from Senator James. Thank you. I would like to first start off by saying, um, I don't plan on getting a divorce, but I'm not leaving Green River at any time. So. Tom, I'm sorry. It, it, let me hold you off, if I may. I believe Bruce wants to switch out your microphone, and we'll put. Let's two try this one, one. hey? <laughs> Checking. Is this better? Now, ladies, please, two minutes on the clock. We'll all act surprised when I say, Senator Tom James. <laughs> all right, let me say that a little bit louder. I don't plan on getting a divorce anytime, so I'm not leaving here at all. <laughs> Did we hear that one better? I heard you loud and clear. Bruce, Great. Is that, is that working well, for you? I'm sure my wife heard that, too. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to say thank you to the Sweetwater GOP. Thank you very much. And I also want to say thank you to Johnny K and Bruce and everyone who took time out of their day to be here, along with my opponent, Stacy. My number one ranked uh, conservative voting record shows I have kept all my campaign promises since I've been in office. I have been working with others in the legislature to bring a bill which would provide stronger protection for government whistleblowers. During the 2021 general session, I worked with others in the, with others in the legislature to bring a bill that brought constitutional carry to Wyoming. I have also been working with others on getting Wyoming on a cash-based budget. And if I have the honor of being placed back in office, I'll be able to continue working with others on transparency project, making all Wyoming public records accessible from your home computer, saving everyone time and money. This is just a small example of how I have honored my promise to you 
my constituents. And as your Senate, as your servant leader, I'd be honored to, con uh, to continue representing you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator James. And if we could keep it right there for our first line of questions. Senator James, do you believe you effectively represent Sweetwater County, Senate District 13, when to date all 15 sponsored bills of yours have failed? If reelected, would you do anything differently to get a bill passed? Uh, thank you for that question. I absolutely believe I have effectively represented the people of Sweetwater County. I have kept every single one of my promises. I have brought bills that would have been effective. Um, it is absolutely a shame that they did not make it through, but if you review any of those bills, if passed, they would have been extremely beneficial to each and every resident of my district of Sweetwater County and to Wyoming. Thank you, Senator. And let me pose a similar question to Stacy Jones. If elected, what would you do differently, if anything, to effectively represent the citizens of Senate District 13? With the Biden administration, uh, Wyoming and Sweetwater County has seen um, a downfall in our economy. And I believe we need a true solid conservative. I can fill those needs. I am a small business owner and I'm also a mother and my two kids were raised in Rock Springs and Green River. I am a realtor and I know everything um, about the art of negotiating and also preserving private property rights. I, um, and I have been a 25 year Republican here and even when that really wasn't very popular in the early days, I also am strong on anything for the second amendment, including hunting and um, owning guns for sport and also for collection. And um, I know I can be a responsible voice for Sweetwater County. Thank you, Stacy. And we have a rebuttal, Senator James. Thank you very much for that. I would like to reiterate, I do have the number one conservative voting record in the Senate in the entire state. So um, as, far in, as far as beating number one, I'm not quite sure how my opponent plans on doing that. Um, as far as being able to negotiate down there, it's just a matter of having what the other person wants and negotiating the people's freedoms and uh, rights. I'm not willing to negotiate that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Stacy Jones, let me come back to you with the next question. You've mentioned already a couple of times this evening about the Second Amendment. Do you support or oppose red flag laws? And please explain. The right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental um, constitutional right. There is no evidence that gun violence can be mitigated by the red flag laws. In fact, a few states have enacted these laws and there is, there is no um, proof that they are effective. I don't believe that we can um, give up our due process without having um, the most stringent of reasons to do that. And I believe that to target um, and dangerous individuals probably is a good idea, except that there is no basis for um, substantiating the claims against someone. And if they are up against the claims, then they don't have a clear constitutional right at that point. And um, Catching a criminal before they do a crime is not a constitutional right, and also this would strip our civil liberties. Very good, thank you. Uh, same question, Senator James. Do you support or oppose red flag laws, and please explain. Thank you for that, thank you for that question. I absolutely oppose red flag laws. Anything that opposes the people's constitutional rights absolutely shall not be infringed is what I believe when I swore an oath in the military and when I swore an oath for this office, I absolutely will uphold that. 
Very good. Thank you, Senator. And let's keep it right there if we could. Senator James, what is your opinion on the future of coal and how can we make up the current revenue shortfall? That's a great question. So for the past couple of years, I've been bringing to leadership within the legislature um, an alternative for coal. The Millennium uh, port out of Washington went under bankrupt. So that port is out of order. We can't use that. So constituent, I don't know if it was actually my constituent, Someone in Wyoming brought to my attention the port out of Lewis and Idaho. So I've been bringing that to the governor. I brought that to his staff. I brought that to leadership. Use the port out of Lewis and Idaho. Talk to them about shipping our coal out of there so that way we can get it across seas. It's fallen on deaf ears. So I've been trying other avenues to try to get the coal out of Wyoming, try and get that industry back moving again. So I'm still working on that. But there is a way to do it. We just have to look outside the box of Wyoming and what we've been doing. There are avenues, and we just got to keep pushing on it. So there are ways to do it. We can also look at that old Atlantic City uh, rail line, just an additional 20 miles. We can connect to Shoshone. We can add competition between the UP and BNSF. We can, there's that old Bighorn uh, short rail. That's the Wyoming company right there. We can employ them. So there's a lot of opportunities to add competition and get that coal out of here. So there's ways. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Let me come back to Stacy Jones with the same question. What is your opinion on the future of coal, and how can we make up the current revenue shortfall? Our coal is some of the cleanest um, burning around, and I do hope we can come up with some solutions in order to to save that part of our economy. I do think we need to look at a couple of our re revenue streams, one of them being tourism. Um, I've been um, welcomed on a side-by-side -side ride with SWAT, and this would um, create trails from Fremont County, um, sublet um, into Uinta and um, these would be um, user trails that they would have to pay a fee. This would create lodging dollars. Our restaurants would get money and also gas. So I do think some of these things we can work on and um, bring more people to enjoy our beautiful county. And a rebuttal, Senator James. I actually just kind of wanted to help her out. So SWAT is Southwest Off-Road Trails. That's a program that... Uh, Southwest Wyoming has it's not the police force SWAT so I just wanted to help everyone out what SWAT was so that was it. Thank you Senator. Let me come back to Stacy Jones if I may. Stacy what would you do to improve civility within the state or rather within the Senate? I think it is extremely important to work hard and have a strong voice with the other legislators. A party of one cannot get anything done. We need someone who is willing to collaborate with the other legislators across the state. It is super important to have these relationships or else you present bills and no one votes for them. This does not help anyone in Sweetwater County or the state of Wyoming. Thank you, Stacy. Let me come back to Senator James. Um, whether or not you agree there may or may not be an issue with civility in the Senate, please explain why you were removed by law enforcement while in a Republican caucus meeting. Absolutely. So uh, we were in a caucus meeting, and they were under the assumption that I was recording the meeting. I was never recording the meeting. Um, and it's not against the rules to record these meetings. It was never, um, forgive me, I'm trying to remember, it was a while ago, so I'm trying to remember at the same time. And if uh, I may, Senator, there was an issue, correct me if I'm wrong, with not putting your cell phone away. Correct, and it's, we're not, there's no rules that say we have to have our cell phones put away, and you know, I'm an adult, I'm allowed to have my phone out. So I wasn't doing anything wrong. And whether I have my cell phone out or not, 
it's we're doing the people's work. We're not trying to keep anything secret, you know. This is open to the public. We're, there's nothing secretive going on. And but yeah, either way, I wasn't doing anything that they were accusing me of. So, but that was I was kicked out because they were accusing me of doing something that I wasn't doing, and they called the police, and that's why I was removed. Very good. Thank you, Senator. And Stacy, did you have a rebuttal? Notice you've got the, your finger on the pulse of what's happening. I do. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I, I think it's um, irresponsible and embarrassing to have to be removed from a meeting. And I do believe if you are requested to do something as simple as put your phone away, the best thing you can do to uh, proceed with their actions, put it away, and not to have to be escorted out by the highway patrol. All right, thank you. Let me come back to Senator James in a different line of questioning. Senator, what is your definition of conservatism, and why are you the right choice for Sweetwater County Republicans? My defi definition of conservatism uh, is take the base word and you can serve. You, you're frugal. You're... Um, you're tight with the people's money in this in this particular position in this particular definition. You're, you know, you can serve the people's money. You're, um, I mean, I never actually really looked at it, so I don't know. I just, yeah, I don't. I just it just is. <laughs> I don't. I don't really know. So, Very good. Stacey Jones, similar question to yourself. What is your definition of conservatism, and why are you the right choice for Sweater County Republicans? I think to be conservative is to be responsible and respectful and have a strong voice. I also think that you should look back to the founding fathers and see what their original intentions were. I think that um, fiscally responsible is also a major component of that. Very good, thank you. And Stacey, let me keep it right there if we could. Accusations have been made that you were handpicked by Senate leadership. Will you please respond to this assertion? Thank you for asking me that question. Unfortunately, I was not handpicked by anyone. My husband and I sat down and hashed it out. I guess you could say I was handpicked by my husband. Um, but um, definitely no one else had a hand in it, just the two of us. I would like to say that along with that accusation, um, there were things said that I didn't complete a gun survey. I most definitely did complete the survey. I signed it. I sent it in on time. And they did not like my answers because I said I will always protect our law enforcement officers. Thank you. Senator James, next question coming your way. Please explain your voting record that is virtually in lockstep with a senator from Cheyenne, and also explain how this might be beneficial to the constituents of Senate District 13. Where we have, I'm not quite sure what the question is really. I, so we have same beliefs and I'm not quite sure what you're Again, trying to ask here. I mean, regarding your voting record that seems to be lockstep with a senator from Cheyenne, is it beneficial for the constituents of Senate District 13? Well, my voting record is extremely constitutional. It's um, it's the number one conservative voting record in the state. Um, it aligns with the party platform. I mean, you can't get much better than that, so absolutely. Very good. And Senator, if I could keep it right there, please. Next question, what are your priorities? And if reelected, what do you hope to accomplish? Thank you for that question. My priorities are, you know, still what they 
were back when I ran the first time. Transparency, accountability, and fiscal responsibility. We still have a major issue with that down there. Um, transparency, still a major issue. Still a lot of hidden stuff going on down there. Um, and as you can see by my website, TomJames4Wyoming.com, trying to uncover everything that's going on down in Cheyenne is a massive project. Uh, we still have a horrible score when it comes to transparency. Accountability, I mean, trying to get anything done down there is a continuing process and trying to get the right people in there is crucial. Uh, trying to get our budget, getting us on a cash based budget would be a major, major step forward. We'd get out of this boom and bust cycle very quickly. We'd be far more stable. Um, and having me back down there would be able to keep us on the right track, get that budget, that cash based budget going. We get that public records uh, database going so you'd be able to access all those public records from your home. It wouldn't cost you anything and it'd be very vital and have us on that transparency um, road very quickly. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tom. Same question to Stacy Jones. What are your priorities, and if elected, what do you hope to accomplish? First and foremost, my agenda is to represent the citizens of Sweetwater County, and I hope I can do it in a fashion that they are all proud of my actions. I have overwhelming support across the state, and not only emotional support, but also monetary support. And a lot of it has come from individuals and um, also industries that, um, the, that is vital to the Speedwater County economy. So I, I'm going to go there and do everything I can to my best ability. Very good. Let me keep it right there, Stacy, if I may. And this actually comes from our home. Before we came down here tonight, Kel and I were discussing the Gettysburg Address. And I'd like to know... What is the number one mantra or platform of the Republican Party, and how do you embody that? I think um, definitely uh, the conservative approach to um, the Republican Party and to respect the Constitution that our founding fathers put in place. And I promise that I will go to protect um, any right given to us through the Constitution and do everything possible to help create a thriving Sweetwater County. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, same question, Tom James. Whether it's platform, mantra, platitude, what is the most important strain of the Republican Party and how do you embody that? Absolutely, upholding and defending the uh, Constitution. And I, I do that today. Um, and I do it when I'm down at the legislature. I think it's extremely important to uphold and defend it. Very good. And uh, we're ready for closing statements. Let me begin with Senator Tom James. Thank you for that. I would like to, uh, to say again, thank you to the Sweetwater GOP, Johnny, Stacy, and everyone who took the time to be here today. I'd like to thank my opponent, Stacy, again for taking the time away from her family and her friends in order to run for office. Over the years, I have received the reputation of being resolute in my position when it comes to defending the people. As you can see by my bills, they are always in the people's interest. So why do I have this reputation of being confrontational and being a big meanie? Well, that's because I stand up to those who wish to weaken your rights. You're damn right I'll get confrontational about it. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what you deserve? An elected who will do the right thing even when no one is looking? An elected who knows it is more important to kill the bad bill even when their own bill doesn't get passed. I have proven repeatedly I am this man. 
I love what I do. I tell everyone about that. To me, this is a way of continuing my military service. And I can't think of anything more honorable than to continue my service serving the people of Senate District 13. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And uh, two minutes on the clock. Closing arguments from Stacy Jones. We are at a crossroads in Sweetwater County with some opportunities on the horizon and some hard battles to be fought. We need a true solid conservative that can help navigate the tough times ahead and maximize our true potential. We need strong legislation for our economy, Second Amendment rights, and access to our beautiful lands. We need respectful representation that we can be proud of. We need to maintain relationships across the state in order to have reasonable legislation passed. We need a calm but strong approach. I can fulfill these needs. My only agenda is to represent the citizens of Sweetwater County. Thank you for coming here tonight. Please vote Stacy Jones for Senate District 13 on August 16th and ask your friends, families, and neighbors to do so as well. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking Tom, James, and Stacey Jones for joining us this evening. This concludes three nights of the GOP party candidate debates coming up on Friday night here at the Broadway Theater. It'll be the mayoral debates and city council debates. Uh, that'll be at 6 o'clock Friday night, and that also will be streamed at Wild 4 News. Thank you. <laughs>